Hello guys, welcome back to another episode of USMLE for free. We're going to be talking about cardiovascular embryology. It has four parts and we're going to be doing the first part today. So let's start. So I teach things a little bit differently. Since the USMLE step one is very vast, you need to know which information is very high yield, which is medium yield and which is low yield. And at the beginning of every video, I'm going to be telling you the most high yield things that you need to know from that page so that you can save time and effort memorizing only the things that come in the exam. The first thing that I need you to know is that the heart is the first functional organ in human beings and it starts beating by week four. Next on this page, we're going to be talking about Cartagner syndrome. Now, Cartagner syndrome is very unique. Basically, there's a molecule in our body called dynin. Dynin has a lot of functions. One of them is movement and that's why it's present in the cilia of the body. It also has a very important role in establishing left-right polarity, which basically means which structures are going to be present on the left side of the body, such as the heart, or which structures are going to be present on the right side of the body. There's a defect in dynin, that means structures which should normally be present on the left side of the body are going to be present on the right side of the body and vice versa. The presence of the heart on the right side of the body is referred to as dextrocardia. Cilia are also present in the fallopian tubes, which are responsible for pushing the egg towards the uterus so that sperm can come and fertilize the egg. Sperm also has dynin in its tail, which allows it to move and reach the embryo so that fertilization can take place. Now that we understand what goes wrong in Cartagner syndrome, I think we can come up with the symptoms on our own. So the first symptom is something we've talked about before. Left-sided structures are going to be present on the right and vice versa. In medicine, this is referred to as situs inversus. Next, we're going to talk about infertility. These patients are going to be infertile. Why? Because one, if they're a female, their fallopian tubes aren't pushing the egg towards the uterus. And two, if they're a male, the tail of the sperm is not moving and not reaching the egg in time. These patients are going to have recurrent sinopulmonary infections. Why? Because the respiratory tract has cilia and because these cilia are not functioning properly, infectious particles are being trapped within the respiratory system and causing infections again and again. This can lead to numerous complications such as recurrent pneumonia, bronchiectasis. So the last important thing on this page is going to be patent foramen ovale. Now, in our human body, the heart has four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. A patent foramen ovale is basically a connection between the two atria. That hole causes a patency, an opening, which allows shunting of the blood from one chamber to the next. Now I need you to understand something. Most of these patients are going to be asymptomatic, meaning they won't have any symptoms. However, there is a certain class of patients who will be symptomatic in the context of patent foramen ovale. These patients are basically those who have DVTs or a thrombus formed in the venous system of the leg. Basically, if that thrombus, which is present in the venous circulation, becomes an embolus and dislodges, reaches the right side of the heart and through that patent foramen ovale, enters the arterial circulation and causes infarction, we call this as a paradoxical emboli. In the context of USMLE, you need to understand something known as the bubble study. A bubble study is basically when we use agitated saline, basically we just use saline that has been agitated a lot, and we introduce those bubbles into the circulation. We see if any bubbles travel from the venous circulation into the arterial circulation through a patent foramen ovale or an atrial septal defect. And if we see any bubbles traveling from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart on echocardiography, this is known as a positive bubble study. Now that we've done the most high yield stuff on the page, let's just read through the rest of the information just to make sure we didn't miss anything. It says here that the primary heart tube loops to establish left-right polarity and this begins in week four of development. Nothing difficult here. Basically, the text is saying that in week four of intraembryonic development, our heart determines which side is going to be the left and which side is going to be the right. 
Now the next part isn't particularly high yield. You just need to have a conceptual understanding of how the interarterial septum is. I want you to take a look at the diagram they've given us. Just imagine the heart as a hollow structure with a few vital components inside of it. One of these structures is known as the endocardial cushion. Now, the gap present between the right atrium and the left atrium at this stage is known as the ostium primium. The endocardial cushion signals the cells at the roof of the heart to grow downwards towards the endocardial cushion. When they grow downwards, the initial membrane formed is known as the septum primum. Now things are going to get a little bit tricky here. The septum primum, which is a small thin membrane separating the right atrium from the left atrium, is going to undergo cell death or apoptosis. At this point, the communication between the right atrium and the left atrium is going to be referred to as the ostium secundum. Now a second membrane is going to be formed. That is called the septum secundum and it develops on the right side of the septum primum and basically just like the septum primum, it goes downwards from the roof of the heart towards the endocardial cushion, forming another interarterial septation. And this membrane is basically going to cover up the defect which was present in the septum primum or the ostium secundum is going to be obliterated. And at this point in time, we have the foramen ovale. The only MCQ that I can think of in the context of interarterial septum formation is what happens when a mother gives birth and we take our first breath. When that happens, the pulmonary ductus arteriosus closes, left arterial pressure rises, and this presses the septum primum against the septum secundum, closing it. When the septum secundum and septum primum have fully fused, we call this as the interarterial septum. But if fusion does not take place properly, we call this as a patent foramen ovale. And that's all there is to it. We're done with part one of our cardiovascular embryology. See you in the next video.